Hey, good morning, everyone from sunny Colorado, and thanks for joining me um, during your lunch hour, probably for most of you. I am Major General Mike Lowe, the Adjutant General of Colorado and the Executive Director of the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. With me today is Lieutenant Katie Lee, Public Affairs Officer. And if you look behind me, we're actually in the Grove Room here at Joint Force Headquarters, Colorado in Centennial. Thanks for joining us. I'm here to answer your questions during our war on COVID-19, but first I want to say a few words about this unprecedented time. It was surreal driving into Joint Force Headquarters today, going through the gate, seeing the gate guards, not being able to roll down the window, and just driving through after showing my ID. Because there's absolutely no one in the parking lots. There's very few cars here, and it's exactly the way it should be. Our folks who are absolutely essential and cannot work from home are in here working day in and day out, trying to keep the essential functions of the National Guard in the state of Colorado. We should also keep the heroes and our members in the civilian community serving the state of Colorado in their civilian careers. These heroes and their families are in our thoughts and prayers. Night and day, these brave Americans, especially those on the front line, are caring for Coloradans who have contracted COVID-19 and are displaying severe symptoms. We must be ever vigilant towards this enemy, which can hide undetected, even in someone who appears healthy. Every American becomes a lifesaver by practicing social distancing and wearing a cloth face mask. On the covid19.colorado.gov website, which gets updated daily at 1600, Colorado has unfortunately had 193 deaths so far, and 54 of our 64 counties are currently reporting cases. Our total COVID-19 positive count exceeds 5,700, with over 1,100 being hospitalized. I know it seems like an eternity, but the first case in Colorado was reported March 5th, a little over a month ago. Governor Polis declared a state of emergency on March 10th, not even a month ago. Colorado's first death was reported on March 13th, with the president declaring a national emergency that same day. Between then and now, your leaders have been working round the clock to ensure the safety of all Coloradans. Ensuring homeland defense missions and our missions abroad are being covered and we're staying ready. They're also working on our current and future readiness for the full spectrum of operations. And of course, the whole of government approach to this war on COVID-19. We must continue our social distancing practices to stop the spread. Everyone contributes to our success, and National Guard members are no exception. Currently, we have members deployed to provide support in UCOM and engaged in combat operations throughout the CENTCOM region. These members and their families are separated during a very difficult time. Their deployments are being extended due to the Department of Defense's stop move in order. I really we all really need to thank those in our ranks and in the community who have volunteered to help our National Guard families with all of these life challenges. These are unprecedented times. We also have soldiers and airmen, airmen working round the clock in Homeland Defense Mission, guarding our skies and defending space. They are all, they are doing all they can to stay healthy so that they continue to defend America. During this pandemic, our priorities are to ensure that our force, families, and all Americans are protected, that we're ready to serve where and when our nations need, and that we employ our capability and capacity to support the whole of governor approach and especially our partners. Our long-standing partnerships in our communities are ensuring a rapid and unified response. Here in Colorado, 
Governor Polis has mobilized more than 300 Colorado National Guard women and men. Nationally, as of this morning, more than 29,400 National Guard professionals are supporting their governors. They are conducting missions from command and control and planning at unified command centers, to building alternate care facilities, to training and logistical support of our first responders. When you add in the Homeland Defense missions, and you add in also our global missions, over 65,000 National Guard professionals are su supporting both the state and nation. That is over 15% of our force, with the others absolutely ready for additional taskings. Here in Colorado, Task Force Test Support helped swab hundreds of Coloradans for the virus at drive-up testing sites throughout the state. Their efforts absolutely limited the spread of the disease within our communities, while also gathering important data for our governor and our partners, especially those at the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment. Task Force Shelter Support is currently helping the state and city and the county of Denver to shelter people who are experiencing homelessness in the midst of this crisis, our most at-risk populations. We have additional task forces providing planners to expand the state and federal response, protecting all Coloradans. I'm proud of what these National Guard members are doing for our communities, both our state and our nation. Today, we stand with all Coloradans, now and through the end of this crisis, or any other where the governor requires our support. We're neighbors in our communities, and we're here to help. We're all in this together, and we'll all get through this together. And so, over the last week or so, we asked many of you to provide some questions ahead of time. And so I thank you for those questions. We'll go through a few of these, some of them are very technical in nature. And then after that, we'll, uh, we'll open it up to the uh, Facebook Live uh, broadcast and see who else has some questions out there that hopefully we can answer. Now, I know you all have many questions. And the biggest thing I tell all commanders and leaders and everybody at every level is to communicate, communicate, communicate. In these unprecedented times, we need to reach out to the force and to everyone. And it's tougher to do as we're in isolation and quarantine and stay at home orders. But we will get to you and we will answer your questions. If not today on this Facebook Live, then at some other time. So please get us your questions. We'll definitely get you answers. Okay, with that, let me, uh, let me answer the first question. We had a member ask basically three questions in one. And it's about how our current situation impacts the Army enlisted promotion system. Cancellation of some of the professional military required education is ongoing. And how we as Colorado are going to deal with it. Well, here was the question. Due to schools getting canceled these past months, how will this impact the next promotion list cycle? How will the state deal with the many soldiers that would have been promotable due to the non-commissioned officer professional development system needing to be complete by a certain date to be put on the list and now will miss this date and not be re-enrolled into a class. Hey, a very detailed question and one we're absolutely committed to answer. First off, we are in unprecedented times. So let me just start with that. Second off, we will do everything we can to support our soldiers and our airmen as they're going through this. So. Here's the current situation on these three questions. Schoolhouses, and this goes from senior developmental education, like Air War College, Armory War College, and all those. Canceling of courses will not affect the promotion list cycle itself. Okay, so let me repeat that. It will not affect the promotion list cycle itself. Soldiers still must meet time and grade requirements. They also must meet time and service requirements and have completed the appropriate distance learning course. 
So as we look at Army Regulation 600-8-19, I told you some of these answers are technical. To be considered for promotion to the next available rank, all of the DLC and those other time and grade and uh, service requirements must be met. Currently, distance learning course is still being conducted. It is self-paced distance learning. As long as soldiers meet the criteria established in AR 600-8-19 and the Colorado Army National Guard G1 Enlisted Promotion Board Memorandum of Instruction, so those two things, soldiers will be considered for promotion during the annual promotion boards. Actual completion of the appropriate resident portion of the NCOES is not tied to the promotion list. Okay. Hopefully that answers the first question for many of those out there wondering if I can still get promoted during this time. Our next question or question two. Some drill uh, guard members find it hard to take two weeks or more off to go to these schools and plan for it because of family and civilian work. Remember, M days or drill status guardsmen are civilians first. Now that the schools have been canceled and new dates have to be looked at for promotion eligibility. What is the state planning on doing to create an exception to policy to add service members to the promotion list and promote without having the needed NCOES? Uh, this actually refers back to the first question. So now, as a former M-Day or Drill Status Guard member, I am keenly aware and sympathetic to the commitments of our members, many of whom are in the community right now in the essential businesses and working on the front lines in this pandemic. Additionally, I do want to stress this though, the bottom line up front, these courses are extremely valuable to the development of our NCO Corps. So I'd like to get there somehow. And you should make every effort to complete the course either in residence when they start again or through a distance learning environment. You are better leaders by going through these schools. Having said that, currently the schoolhouses are working various courses of action to try to mitigate the impact of soldier promotions as much as possible. We know it impacts the force. Some courses such as the basic leader course and master leader course are working on adjusting their curriculum into fully distance learning based courses. While not the most optimum, they can get done this way. Some courses are readjust, readjusting school dates to occur later in the, in the year and directly shifting students into that course. And some, unfortunately, are, fat, are flat out canceling courses. Now I know this doesn't help if you had planned to already attend this or were planning on the upcoming, but Bear with us, please do, because as these courses are developed, we will get more information out. And I need the soldiers to work closely with their unit, with their unit and their leadership, as every soldier impacted by these cancellations has unique circumstances that need to be factored in when resolving NCOES attendance. Now, both from my leadership standpoint, through our leaders all the way down, to the Colorado Army National Guard G3. They, we are developing a plan on how to manage allocated NCOES seats in fiscal year 21, okay, starting in October, to accommodate soldiers who are canceled out of a course in our current fiscal year due to COVID-19 travel restrictions. As a matter of fact, we've got 30 Army planners right now working on our impacts to readiness due to COVID support. And we're bringing those on currently as we speak to address everything from how do we maintain unit level readiness to collective training when this opens up, and then what will be the new norm until we actually defeat this COVID virus. So we have 30 planners that we're bringing on to get after just this question. NCO resident attendance is not required again, not required, to be placed on a promotion list. Right now, because of that, there is no plan for an exception to policy because one isn't needed. And if you look at the PPOM, or Personal Policy Operational Memorandum, 
20-010, does address actually the process and how soldiers who would have met pin-on requirements had their course been conducted. So we have a solution already in place. That specific guidance has been pushed to unit command teams and full-time unit support staff. So if you check in with your chain of command, they should have those answers for you on exactly where you stand. Soldiers who believe they would have been promoted upon completion of their NCOES, had their course not have been canceled, need to contact the unit to see if PPOM 20-10 applies to them. Finally, as we have learned this past month, we're really a month into, us, into this, things are rapidly changing. And as you know, military members adapt quickly to these chaotic environments. In the future, as you think about how we've been able to operate in this environment of a pandemic response and a continuity of operation plans and overall support for Colorado and the nation, and we've seen things develop throughout, I foresee some measures of blended learning. Because we've proven we can do it, now we must institutionalize that in the future. Okay, hopefully that answers question number two. All right, question three. Ah, this, this, is, a, uh, this is a good one because it talks about how we do the national response framework. Do you see a situation in which immediately response authority, Department of Defense Directive 3025-18, can, would, should be used by a commander in response to the COVID-19 issues around Colorado communities? Boy, that's a great question because immediate response authority comes up all the time as we talk about uh, our support to local, um, local responders. See, the answer your, to your specific question is likely no. However, as we say in the air power world, flexibility is the key to air power. Remember, immediate response authority is where local incident commanders reach directly to us for support. Therefore, if we didn't have the county emergency operations center and the state emergency operations center, which is now a unified command center, activated, it would be more likely. However, because we have those, on, and, out, and on March 10th, we received an executive order from the governor mobilizing the first of many Colorado National Guard members into state active duty status to conduct missions. Then I believe it less likely. Um, just, uh, just as a point of order, on March 10th, when the Emergency Operations Center was activated, of course, one of the first units they call is the National Guard. And our liaison reported within two hours to the Emergency Operations Center, and they have been there 24-7 ever since. They were one of the first to respond to stand up what is now the Unified Command Center. Currently, we have received authorization to begin placing soldiers and airmen on Title 32 orders to use federal funds directly authorized through the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA. And it's through that mission assignment process to engage in this fight on COVID-19. I'm confident between the two authorities, both state and federal, that we'll have the right resources at the right time to support our citizens and protect our force. Immediate response authority is typically used when a threat to life, limb, or great property damage occurs so quickly that we don't have the ability to stand the system up. So it's an authority that's in place that provides National Guard support. Right now, we do have that support system, that command and control system in place, so I see it being less likely. But I would also ask you, to remember that just because we're actively engaged with state and federal partners against COVID-19, it doesn't mean that we won't be called to defend the state and nation against other threats. Uh, right now, we're starting to enter the wildland fire threat. We're expecting, due to the great snowpack that we have, a relatively mild year, but not so in all of the Western United States. COVID-19 also has caused the firefighting community to evaluate and change some of their normal tactics. And the quick application of water on a fire, as opposed to managing a longer burn, is part of some of the planning that's going into this year. 
It's entirely possible that we may see National Guard forces called out in immediate response, especially in that urban wildland firefighting scenario or any other status more rapidly in the past influenced by our nation's war on COVID-19. Great question. Thanks again. All right, another question that came in, do we have the ability to provide personal protection equipment to members where there is legitimate need on the civilian side? An example, healthcare workers who do not have proper PPE at their clinics. Boy, that is a great question and it is tracked absolutely every day at our Unified Command Center at the state level. So the requirements that come out of the hospital and the first responder communities from firefighters, law enforcement and that, all the way to our, our folks in emergency room is being tracked at the Unified Command Center. And PPE, as you know on the news, is in short supply everywhere. We, as a National Guard, should not be competing with hospitals and other first responders for items like M95 masks, face shields, gloves, and gowns. If we have excess, when they are needed and available, then we should provide them to the UCC for distribution. Right now, that has not been asked. However, when we are tasked to support a mission, the organization that tasks us provides PPE for airmen and soldiers participating in the mission. The Department of Defense is currently working on is working hard to determine what vital equipment we can provide to the responder community and is actively supporting multi-agency efforts where they can. We have flown PPE from overseas. We have flown testing kits. We have moved equipment. The National Guard in particular has moved equipment from the West Coast to the East Coast to the hardest hit areas up in the Northeast and FEMA Region 2. And if you are on mission and given PPE, it's because it's needed for you to stay safe. Use it, ensure you wear it, wear it properly, and ensure you take it off properly. If there is excess, ensure it goes back to the agency that provided it. It's important as we provide support to our neighbors that we remember that our number one priority is to preserve the health of our force not only for this fight against COVID-19, but also for any other missions our nation may need us to accomplish. We need to remain healthy in order to provide the support necessary, as do our first responders. As the uh, Center for Disease Control and other federal guidelines change, the Colorado National Guard is carefully procuring equipment for our workforce and ensuring we don't compete for critical resources that our medical and first responder community need. Thanks again for that question. All right, uh, another question. Oh, this is a lengthy one. I'm writing to you about my team that has already been deployed for seven months and was originally scheduled to leave our area responsibility within the next week and a half. Unfortunately, the coronavirus pandemic has caused some major worldwide concerns. We are understanding of those, of those issues. However, this is a team full of first-time deployers and they have performed above and beyond expectations, earning awards and recognition within the units they are supporting. On day one of this deployment, we were blindsided by an additional 45 days on top of what we were anticipating. We have obviously come to grips with that over the ensuing months. Now we are facing a potentially substantial extension on top of an already long deployment due to unpredictable circumstances dropped at a very late point in the game. Okay, so the question, is there a reason that mandatory quarantines can't be built into our orders to facilitate deployers and redeployers, allowing for a more timely rotation without forcing teams like ours to be away from our families even longer than we already have? Most of the stuff I have read states that, is, that a serious 14 to 15 day quarantine will wait out the virus and ensure that those people are symptom free. This will still allow us to meet the intent of the STOP movement, which is to avoid spread of the virus. Any insight you could shed on this topic will be greatly appreciated. Okay, and then they go on. We definitely want to be told that we are coming home on time, but if that ship has sailed, it would be helpful for us to at least have some definitive answers about how much longer 
We will be away from our families so we can mentally prepare for that. The not knowing is very difficult on us and our loved ones. I know you understand our concerns, and again, I appreciate your time and efforts in this. Okay, so if you don't know, I'm on calls almost daily with, uh, with what's going on on the federal side, as well as daily cabinet calls for what's going on on the state side. Right now, we are currently tracking over 300 Colorado National Guard members that are in this situation. And I definitely know you all are performing exceptionally each and every day. Now, the for, now for actual what I would call the reality of an ever-changing situation where we have both a mission and people-focused purpose, right? It's mission and people that we're trying to, to uh, solve here. And it goes back to the complexities of global force management, or GFM, and the state of the pandemic in each nation. There is absolutely no easy way to address the movements through the use of 14-day quarantines. Um, I was on a uh, call with Jordan the other day, and what they're doing in Jordan is different than what they're doing in Saudi Arabia, which is different than what they're doing in Slovenia or Italy. I was currently uh, with our state partners in Slovenia when these restrictions initially surface and understand exactly what 14 days of quarantine means. It is not easy and it is uncertain because halfway through notice whether the 14 days was going to be the limit, then other things change. So COVID-19 impacts on global force management are widespread. And the current stop movement order continues right now through the 11th of May. Department of Defense leadership is keenly aware of the impacts this order has on the health and welfare of our service members and their families and are absolutely trying to address this situation. I assure you that as soon as there is resolution and that's resolution, we will make every effort for our warriors and their families and get them notified as quickly as, as we can. And when I say I'm on calls at the national level, everyone from the Secretary of Defense, been on a call, we've been on a couple calls with him, and the Joint Chiefs of Staff to our local leaders are tracking this situation. Right now, we are planning for deployment movements to begin after May 11th. However, the Department of Defense is still assessing the COVID-19 pandemic and will continue to update policy as the situation develops. Just like here in Colorado, we extended the stay-at-home order another couple weeks. I anticipate that they will look at this as it gets closer. On a positive note, however, it appears that the measures many states and nations have taken to fight COVID-19 are working, which may help accelerate the timelines. If you look at the data here in Colorado, we're seeing that curve bend. That doubling time is actually expanding out, so the curve is bending. I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, uncertainty kills us. It kills the uncertainty of our families who want to know exactly when and where. It kills uncertainty with you and your ranks. And right now, there's too much uncertainty to make a definitive call. Just realize that yes, we are absolutely sympathetic to this. Everyone of, of our leadership team and members, all the way from the national level down to the local level, of, on your base, know exactly what is, what is going on and we'll get you the information as quickly as I can. Now, having said that, please let your chain of command know of any hardship on you or on your families. There are members of this community that have called me directly and said, how can I help? How can I support? How can I support those members that are on the front lines, either in their civilian career or working as National Guard underneath the governor? How can I help those deployed overseas? So we have resources out there. So please let us know your particular hardship and get that information back to us and, and we'll take care of it. All right, another question came in. If I understand correctly, members activated for COVID-19 support will be placed on Title 32 orders instead of state active duty. Do you anticipate the need to extend past 30 days? If so, will these be 30 days orders of base pay only or 31 plus day orders affording members entitlements like 
base, basic allowance for housing and basic allowance for subsistence and the ability to certify orders at the beginning rather than waiting until the end of the order. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, we just actually got authorized by presidential declaration. I think it was declaration number four or five uh, that came out that put Colorado on that list for uh, Title 32, 502F2 uh, orders and 100% and funding through FEMA mission assignments. And like many National Guard states across the country, we're moving towards transitioning from state active duty to federally funded orders under state control. The president indicates that he sees the states in the lead and the federal government in support of each state is different. And governors are able to make the best decisions with their leadership teams on how to fight the COVID-19 threat. What works and impacts Colorado is not the same as what works and impacts Montana, as an example. We all know that. We've, we've dealt with emergencies and it's always best to leave it at the local level. Part of this is transitioning National Guard support as it allows us more agility in our response and creates better ability to, get, to take care of our soldiers and airmen. So, we have been authorized to put our soldiers and airmen on for a 31-day uh, duration. We believe this is the right timeline based on both the timing and nature of our support requirements and the access to benefits such as TRICARE that come from extended federally funded duty. So between now and early next week, any of those members who are currently on state active duty, we will transition them again from a federal mission assignment through FEMA to a Title 32 order. Hopefully that answers that question. All right, here's one from somebody on the front lines. I'm a registered nurse in a local hospital emergency room. If I get deployed to state active duty, my hospital leadership wants to ensure that I will be able to stay on the front lines of the pandemic, or will I be pulled to be with the medical set? Uh, I'm assuming like a, a medical planner and not on the front lines. Okay, boy, this, uh, this has been asked of, uh, of me, both by the governor, our local leadership, uh, emergency rooms. So I've fielded many calls on this one. And First and foremost, thank you. We got docs, emergency room docs on the front lines without proper PPE right now. They're telling me shortages are out there. You are absolutely on the front lines. You have faced death right there. And so I, I applaud you and your ER team for protecting lives and trying to save them. And I need to keep you absolutely engaged in this fight. We all hear stories about how challenging things are in our hospitals across the country and how heroes in the medical community are rising to that challenge. So absolutely we thank you. Okay, it is my intent, it is our intent, it's the governor's intent that in the Colorado National Guard as a great partner in response to the community to not remove our National Guard members from their important roles in their frontline roles in fire, law enforcement, and medical community when their presence is needed here. Governor Polis is, clean, is keenly aware of that requirement and wants National Guard members to add to the capacity required for first responders, not just shift it from one place to another. Although we continue to seek limited amounts of medics and other medically qualified personnel as part of our task forces to ensure and monitor what our folks, soldiers and airmen are doing daily. Um, we're focused on those providers who actually work for the Colorado National Guard on a full-time basis or do not serve in a required medical role on the civilian side. Early in this, we stood up a joint medical planning group. Some of those are still involved in first response in their community. Others, because they've been able to take time away from their practice, have been able to come in and provide that medical planning. And then others are also your full-time members in the medical community. So with all that support right now, we, we are 
we've been asked and we've gone out to seek exactly what capability and capacity that we can add to the medical community and add to the first responder community and not take it away. So I know it's a challenging time, but between military and civilian roles, please address it. If they're actually looking for folks, please address it with your chain of command because we do put out prepare to deploy orders and, and warning orders. And if we do that and you see yourself in this situation, please directly engage with your chain of command and let them know exactly what you're doing. We need to add the capacity and not take it away. Next question came in, will the Colorado National Guard be activated to support other states? Ah, that's a good one. Uh, because right now we have almost 30,000 National Guard members supporting their state, their communities, and their neighbors across the country. Every state right now has the funding and authority to utilize their National Guard in support of the whole of government approach to COVID-19. Our close uh, neighbor states in FEMA Region 8 can continue to plan and execute missions in support of their governors. I have not, we have not seen any demand signal for moving National Guard capabilities from state to state. We have moved logistical support like ventilators from one place to another. Now, that doesn't mean it can or it won't happen. I can't predict the future, especially as we've executed this pandemic like never before. And if a state requests our support through the use of the Emergency Management Assistant Compact, i.e. governor to governor requests that, and the Unified Command Center at the state sources the Colorado National Guard, we will absolutely be there for another state if we can provide that capability that that other state needs. We'll do our best to help all Americans from every state if needed. Thank you for that question. All right, next one. In regards to high-risk personnel who are also essential personnel, what guidance do you have for them in order to ensure their safety and yet be able to ensure the state mission to continue operations. Actually, I think it's both the state and the federal mission to continue operations because we've been doing um, homeland defense missions, which have been continuing. Um, you've seen a basic uh, change in the way we're, we're doing our workforce now with telework where we can, uh, smaller teams, alternating work schedules in order to ensure our homeland defense missions 24 seven, and of course, be prepared for the state mission. So each and every civilian, soldier, and airman who we have in the fight or are preparing to be in this fight or other fights is absolutely essential. The Colorado National Guard is unique because we have several 24-7 missions and they're no-fail missions that we execute each and every day. Obviously, these folks are clearly mission essential, but so is the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs employee who continues to monitor, clean, and maintain our facilities. The soldier who prepares pay documents for deploying task forces. The airman who is feeding personnel at Buckley Air Force Base. You, I, and every one of our National Guard members is absolutely essential. So what do I tell each member of the team? I tell them the same thing. First, we need you to stay ready. Ready for the fight. Ready for the unexpected. So that's mental and physical preparation. Command Sergeant Major Woods continues to say that this will be a marathon. I treat it like this is the first round. Right now our social distancing in the state of Colorado is hovering between 70 and 80 percent. And that is bending the curve and delaying the outset. And it's protecting our most at-risk populations. As we see where the capacity starts getting built back up, we will start loosening some of those and maybe drive things like 50% or 30% and then see what happens there. That will be, that'll institute round two if required. So there'll be multiple rounds until we can act absolutely defeat COVID-19. And so, I see it coming about as a marathon, like Sergeant Major Wood said, and we'll need you the whole way 
to cross that finish line in order to get there. Secondly, we know we don't know everything about COVID-19 or any coronavirus for that matter. We are doing a lot of learning, but we do know a few things. One is, and we've seen it in our own ranks, you can be contagious before you have any symptoms. You can be contagious without symptoms too. Two, the only real way we can all do our part to stay in the fight is to establish, to follow established policy and recommendations for personal hygiene, social distancing, wearing of masks, and state and local stay-at-home orders. Follow that direction. The life you save may not just be your own, but it may be somebody else's. If you are called into a situation where you are forced to perform a mission that puts those rules at risk, ensure you wear a mask and any other PPE prescribed by your leadership. We need all of you to stay healthy and stay in this fight. In these tough times, I really do count on our leaders, officers and enlisted, formal and informal leadership to make the right call and be the on-scene decision maker for the health of our force. Each and every day, you all make a difference for this. Okay, I think it's time uh, to, uh, yeah, we've been at this a while, to take a few questions. So whatever, uh, whatever's on your mind, please come in and, uh, and let us know. How will this affect recruiting efforts? Ah, man, recruiting efforts are tough right now. Um, I'll, I'll give you my, two, uh, my uh, two things on recruiting. First off, because of the stay-at-home orders, the social distancing, our recruiters are no longer hands-on. So everything we're doing on the recruiting side is through an electronic platform, whether it's a phone call, um, whether it's a face, uh, FaceTime, whether it's, be, whether it's a Facebook, anything that we can do, WebEx is great. The problem is we've also shut down the pipeline to go into recruiting. And I say shut down, we've, we've restricted it. So in order to go to a recruiting station now and get shipped, obviously you have to go through a MEP station. In order to get that, it has to be scheduled. In order to get that, it just, it is almost, nothing's impossible, but it is gonna take some time to get through all those things. And so right now on the recruiting side, it's gonna take us absolutely a long time to regen back up recruiting. We're also limited on shipping down to even those recruits that are fully qualified that have gone through this. We're limited on where we can ship. And then once they get there, they're most likely entering a 14 day quarantine, which extends their basic training and follow on training and movements. So it hasn't stopped the training pipeline, but it has severely limited. And it's also severe, severely limited our recruiters from doing that. So the health, of, the long-term health of the force has an immediate impact. Now, with that, um, I know in Colorado that we have over, this last week, we processed over a million unemployment claims. We also are going to be graduating high school students this year into this uncertain environment as, uh, as it occurs. And I know that some of those people want to serve their community, state, and nation. They want to serve in the National Guard. They want to be able to do both a homeland defense mission, a deployed mission overseas, and of course, when crisis strikes, be members of the community, put on a uniform, and go down to the convention center and serve. So we need to get out, and every single one of us is a recruiter, and please direct them to the recruiters that are out there to let them know all the great benefits of being National Guard members. Thank you. Katie, what else you got? Can retirees be activated or can they volunteer to help? Yes, and, and I will say that. So right now, uh, there are waivers in place both on the Army side and on the Air Force side to bring in medical professionals back out of retirement 
again, in order to add to that. If you're a retiree out there that wants to get back in, please make a phone call. So please get with the personnel side of the, of the business. Um, one of the leaders will be able to direct you to a recruiter and see that. On the volunteer side, absolutely. We send out uh, many emails. We'll direct people, and, and I just direct them in the state of Colorado here to the uh, covid19.colorado.gov website where it has a place for volunteers. And so there's a lot of volunteers that have uh, gone there in order to make that happen. So I think absolutely you can. Think about what you can do both in your local community, think about what you can do for the state and nation. And if you have those special skill sets that can help, please give us a call and we'll try to direct you in the right way. Katie, what else you got? Are there any plans to expand numbers of personnel to be getting on VPN, knowing that there's been an issue with many people teleworking? Um, yes, and actually it's occurred. So um, both on the Army Guard side with uh, Colonel Martinez and on the Air Guard side with Colonel Acosta, um, I've been in touch with, with both of them because it is frustrating. When all of a sudden we went to telework, it, uh, it obviously crushed the system. But we're just not competing with our own, own self. We're also competing with the businesses that are using uh, WebEx and Zoom we're competing with the schools, so that bandwidth is tight. And I know in parts of rural Colorado, we have a problem with getting that. We're addressing it from a state level. I'm trying to get more and more. Uh, the commercial internet providers have upped as much as they can, and they're continuing to do that. In the National Guard side, both on the Air and Army side and the systems that are out there, we are um, expanding the amount of EPNs in the National Guard to over 30,000 on the Air National Guard side. We're also, uh, they've also um, probably sent an email, of course it's to your military system, which you probably don't have access to, in order to have a desktop that can be on any computer. So it does, doesn't have to be on a military computer that will allow you to get into the system. On the Army Guard side, we went out right after this and bought two new servers to expand the network. And so we are actually spending money and building out the system absolutely as fast as we can. Uh, do I envision a day where we're all able to get in? Yes. Do I think it's going to be a little bit further off? Absolutely. But nope, we're trying to do that stuff. Matter of fact, this last uh, drill weekend would have been a great test. And we have some great lessons learned out of the Army as we went to virtual drill. And so we, we tried every bit of both civilian technology and the military technology out there to, uh, to, get, to engage with our soldiers. So thanks for that question. But yes, we are expanding it as quickly as we can. Okay, and this will be our last question. Will wartime readiness and PT standards be maintained and or how will we monitor these things? Okay. Um, so absolutely, in an uncertain world, which we, which we live in today with actors that are out there that will challenge um, the role of the United States throughout the world, we absolutely have to maintain our readiness. So how, how are we going about doing this? And there was a couple of questions in there. So, so let, me, let me talk about uh, the readiness side first. We know that obviously when you shut down drill weekend, it impacts readiness. There's nothing you can do about that. I know that when we have stay at home orders and we have people that are actually working remotely and cannot come in and do things like fly airplanes, work on Humvees and do that that it impacts equipment readiness and it impacts the readiness of our force. Again, we're in round one. So now, how do we get to a point where we, where I call we sprint readiness? I.e., things open up, we're getting back together. I think some things don't change. When we come together, and um, I was out at Buckley the other day, and the engine shop was doing an engine change. So four or five people around one engine. In the future, they'll have a mask on, gloves. When you can't social distance, they're going to be having as much PPE as required in order to stop this. Remember, it's a silent killer. So we are going to come back together in order to do that. As obviously it gets um, out of our community and we're able to come back together, then we need to sprint and do that. So on the Army Guard side, I have 30 planners working on what that looks like. 
so that when we can come back together, what do I need? What contracts do I need? The resources are there. How do I maintain my medical readiness? And when can I get that done? How do I maintain my individual readiness? And then also, how can I maintain unit readiness? We're going to sprint to get it done as quickly as we can. And then, now that we'll maintain that readiness, we'll continue to adapt as we move forward. So that was the first question. Physical fitness. Um, Sergeant Major Woods and I talk about uh, what we're doing each and every day to maintain our physical fitness. Both me for uh, the Air Force's physical fitness standards, him for the Army, and how he's getting ready for the Army combat fitness test. Right now, both the Air and the Army have put those on pause. That does not mean it's ended. It just means it's on pause. Each and every day, I, I do something physically relevant in order to maintain my physical, which also helps me with my mental resilience. Look around your house. Look around your work center. There are tons of things that you can do without actually going to the gym. I've gone back to, uh, to what my drill instructors told me in airborne school. Hey, trust me, you can do a lot of stuff right around your own house in order to stay physically ready. So just spend the time, do it in shorter spurts maybe, but continue your physical readiness. Please do. Got time? Probably one more, if you got one. Um, how do you see this affecting involvements with upcoming planned exercises during the pandemic? Uh, well, right now we're, we're canceling, we, the Department of Defense, is canceling all the exercises. I won't say all of them, but anything that uh, is going to bring large groups together, we're not doing. Anything that's moving people from one country to another, we're not doing. So everything right now, I would say, is shut down, except for real combat, real world operations, and how that stop movement order and how we do this in the future to move in and out during the pandemic will change. Now, having said that, um, again, the planning team that's coming forward is looking at, okay, what can we do once these stop moving orders are lifted? What can we do once, uh, once this has, again, round one, has waned to the point that we can open things back up? And then how do, how do we do it in the future? So right now we're looking at scheduling things like Guernsey Range. Right now, um, the deployment to Volk Field um, and the air guard is off, but they're looking at alternatives. So I see smaller groups getting together, maintaining that readiness, and I see less collective right now until we can actually figure out how we're going to move the force. So absolutely readiness is, 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 uh, is first and foremost on my mind, and it's readiness for everything from dealing with the pandemic to readiness for dealing with what's going on in CENTCOM and taking on, uh, on that. And of course, our homeland defense and deterrence operations throughout the world. So, great question on readiness. Things will change. The nice thing about the military is, uh, is we'll adapt to meet all those challenges and changes like we have ever since you entered basic training. You learn to adapt in basic, you learn to adapt in this crisis also. So, all right. Lee, one more? Let's see. We still got a couple minutes. How do you yeah. think the stay at home effect will affect technicians and or maintainers in the process? Yeah. So um, you, should, uh, you should actually have been, uh, been informed by your leadership and things that are going on of what we're doing. So maintenance is still occurring. Um, we had to lock down both uh, the Air Guard and the Army Guard for a little while in order to figure out. Uh, what it looks like in order to bring smaller teams in so that we don't risk this COVID-19 to the entire force. We've seen what can happen when, when, uh, when we don't do social distancing, don't have PPE, don't have the proper sanitation, uh, sanitation practices. So we've ordered that. Um, when you look around here at Joint Force Headquarters, the place is absolutely clean. Why? Because we're not using it but we also have everything stocked and filled. Uh, so your work center is probably changed. You don't know it yet because maybe you haven't been there. 
So as we lift these orders and we need you to come in and perform duty, we're going to call you in and we're going to figure out how to do that in a, in a probably a smaller team than we had before. And it's just, you know, team one, team two, team blue, team red, whatever it happens to be, so that we limit the amount of cross uh, contamination, if you will, or to where one team member can affect multiple teams out there and in order to do that. When you look at this, uh, with, when you look at the disease and the pandemic, it spreads because we're sneezing, we're coughing, um, we're doing that, or we're touching things where it's already been. And it lives on hard surfaces. Obviously, the Joint Medical Planning Group gave me all this information, but it lives on hard surfaces uh, up to about three days, but it's really dependent on the temperature, the moisture level. And so, so when, when you look at the three day time frame, if somebody comes into a work center that has it, then that could shut down that work center for three days, or I have to bring in an entire team to clean. So that's why wearing face masks, wearing protective equipment, washing your hands is absolutely essential. For those first responders, we take lessons from them. They're going in each and every day, you know, spending 12 hours, sometimes longer shifts, right at the heart of this. And so when they come home, either they've isolated from their family because they know they've been exposed to it, they take off their clothes, they wash them in extremely hot water, they clean themselves as they get home, and they don't expose it and spread it out to others. So we're learning a lot of this pandemic. I think we're going to learn more as we move forward. And uh, from a technician workforce, just like an AGR workforce, just like an M-Day workforce, we'll get through it, and then we'll come back together in order to make that work. Okay. Yep, we're, uh, we are about out of time. If you have more questions, uh, please send them in. We'll try to get them answered as quick as we can. Um, thanks for all you do. Thanks for joining us today. It's been a very special day. I look forward to seeing you at our next Facebook Live or hopefully back all together here at, uh, at anywhere the National Guard is out there. Until then, stay ready. Keep yourself and your family safe. Your National Guard, always ready, always there. Thank you very much.